first, thank you, uh, uh, professors Ben Oden and uh, Friedrichsen, uh, for the kind invitation to all of you for uh, for com either coming for the first time or uh, revisiting uh, for this talk. Um, so uh, let's get right to it. Um, so uh, today's talk is on cursing and aphasia and neurological disorders. Uh, just to give a brief background. Um, so I am a cognitive psychologist, but I'm also a speech language pathologist. Um, and during my, some of this interest in this came uh, during my clinical fellowship and a few years after where I was working clinically. And I was noticing that people were cursing at me very, very often, whether it was someone with Alzheimer's disease, whether it was someone after an anoxic brain injury, whether it was someone with aphasia or TBI. And the, and the flavor of their cursing seemed to be different. Um, uh, and I've always wondered that as you know, a decade went by, I started to figure out, okay, well, now's the time I'm gonna really start taking a look at it. So the interest in this came out of my clinical uh, observation. Um, and it's a relatively new topic of investigation for me. So um, uh, first, a roadmap to what we're gonna be doing today. I'll probably talk about 50 minutes or so. I will take any questions that you have. Um, uh, today on this first slide, who we have here is the American comedian, George Carlin, uh, who was arrested in 1977 after his famous talk, uh, Seven Words You Can, uh, Routine, Seven Words You Can Never Say on Television. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, very, very famous, uh, a great cursor, great American cursor. Uh, so we'll, the talk today is in three parts. We'll talk about the psycholinguistics of cursing, uh, and then we'll talk about neurological disorders where cursing is very, very common. Um, and then we'll talk about some recent research in our lab using TDCS to see if we can modulate uh, people's levels of arousal or their behavior during cursing. Um, uh, so let's get to it. Um, okay. Uh, part one, uh, the psycholinguistics and neurolinguistics of cursing. So uh, here what we have is another comedian who was arrested, and this is the 1950s, this was Lenny Bruce, uh, after uh, he was arrested for public obscenity for cursing on stage. Um, uh, cursing is not uh, necessarily indicative of a neurological disorder. That's one of the most important things to take out of this. Today's talk is really gonna be about neurogenic cursing. That is cursing that emerges in the context of a neurological disorder. Some degree of cursing is perfectly normal in, in, uh, in daily discourse. So how much is normal is a, big, uh, is a big question and it's very, very difficult to study. So if you look at frequency counts when we do, where you as uh, psycholinguists, when we get, grab frequency counts for words like dog and table, they're based on news, um, news groups and text. Uh, where you can't curse. Um, and so getting accurate frequency counts of how often fuck occurs in English is somewhat difficult. Uh, the few sort of kind of naturalistic studies like diary studies or Lena studies type studies um, have shown that there is a, the sort of normal range of cursing is 0.3 to 0.7 percent of all words that the average American adult says, um, uh, with some degree of variance up to about 3 percent. Um, and so think of like one out of every hundred words-ish um, is, uh, is a curse word uh, in our daily discourse. Um, just some trivia on cursing. So the most cursing in a mainstream film was from The Wolf of Wall Street, um, where uh, just the F-bomb itself, uh, in a 180 minute movie, there were three F-bombs per minute. It's a lot of cursing and a lot of, uh, in one movie. So cursing isn't all bad. Uh, there are some benefits. Uh, so there's some really, really interesting data on you know, when you hit your finger with a hammer, uh, what, why do we curse? Um, turns out that uh, cursing can actually improve uh, pain. Uh, it has analgesic effects in terms of pain. So studies by a group uh, Stevens has shown that when you hold your hand in an ice bath and you curse, uh, you can hold it in there for 50, 50, 40 to 50% longer if you're cursing relative to your saying animal names or something like that. Power, the same things. So you curse while you're doing a, a grip strength task and you have 25% 20, more power during the task. Other benefits of cursing involve social bonding and trust. So there are times when it's expected to curse and people will trust you more. People have reported trusting politicians more who curse more um, uh, than, uh, than not. And then finally, another benefit is we can think of cursing as a pressure valve. Um, so this is an interesting phenomenon when we think of TBI and cursing, traumatic brain injury, we think that people curse because they have inhibitory control problems. We think, okay, they just can't control themselves. 
Healing Jackson was a physiologist who argued, well, really, it, that is a form of inhibitory control because what TBI patients would be doing would be punching you otherwise, right? So they're inhib so cursing comes as basically a, a way of inhibiting violence. Um, and so we can think of cursing as, you know, basically this pressure valve. So these are the benefits of cursing. Um, uh, there are some common folk beliefs about cursing uh, uh, that uh, people, cur who, people who curse more curse because they have uh, basically very little lexical proficiency or vocabulary uh, facility with language. So this common folk belief is that people who curse are, have lower IQ and lower verbal abilities. When in fact, when people look at that empirically, there is almost no correlation, and if anything, they demonstrated a weakly positive correlation. That is, people who uh, curse more tend to have uh, tend to be a positive association with IQ. Um, other aspects of cursing, it's very, very common across natural languages. It's very, very rare for a natural language to uh, not have taboo words. Um, one noteworthy exception uh, that's been talked about is Japanese. Um, Japanese doesn't specifically have curse words the same way we do in English. They have rude words and they have intensifiers. So if you if you know you really wanted to insult someone uh, in in Japanese, you you, you could call them you know, a rude word like fat, um, and then add in adding intensifiers like very 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 fat. Um, and so, uh, but the you know that's as close that they get the, to the level of uh, sort of curse words that we have in English. Common themes across natural languages that have been tested include denigrate, mostly the most common one is denigration of women, specifically mothers, body parts, body products, uh, sex acts, and uh, words about, uh, scatological words, words about pooping. Um, uh, interestingly, many states re retain legal statutes prohibiting cursing. So, uh, you know, since this talk's being held at, at, uh, through CSTAR, uh, uh, primarily at, you know, University of South Carolina, I found a law that South Carolina basically, uh, it's illegal to curse if you were within earshot of a, uh, of a church in South Carolina. Um, and so you can be charged with a misdemeanor um, for that. And since, you know, since there's lots of churches in South Carolina, uh, it's pretty dangerous to curse there. Um, come to Pennsylvania for that. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, we've done some recent work looking at uh, how do how do listeners? What is it about the power of taboo words and curse words that it exhibits such strong physiological effects? Why does it? Why when you hit your hand, do you do you yell fuck and not you know ouch? Um, so we looked at you know basically prediction of uh, prediction of when a listener hears a word. What is it about the word? So curse words are really really unique in this regard because they, there is something about the sound of a word. Um, uh, it's curse words sound are basically sound symbolic. Uh, they're four letter words, many stop consonants. So there's something about the sound, but also that interacts with the meaning. Um, so this idea that many curse words relate religious acts, sex acts, gender. Um, there's some complex interaction between phonology, the sound of the word, and semantics. Um, two recent studies uh, that uh, in Slate and Discover uh, recent, recently highlighted articles on our lab's work. Uh, in this one about the shit gibbon, this involved a senator um, who called uh, Donald Trump a shit gibbon. And people got really, really interested in why is it that words, why is it that some words combine really, really well to form other curse words? So we did a study on that and basically how, what are, what are the structural properties that predict whether words combine well? And in this other study, we looked at predictors. Basically, what do, what do people weigh when they, when they hear a curse word, right? One of the big theories, um, and again, back to psycholinguistics, we're really not used to looking at the link between emotion and language too much. But when we talk about curse words, um, uh, emotion and emotion dysregulation becomes extremely important. So one of the early theories about how uh, curse words, how curse words, one of the big things, factors that influence the power of curse words, deals with this interaction between emotional valence and arousal. Um, and here's an illustration of what that means. If we look at valence here on this, on the y-axis, we can think of words that have um, very, very negative emotional uh, associations, and in other words, that have very, very positive associations. That's valence. Um, so it goes, valence goes from negative to positive. And another variable is that you can think of crossing with valence is physiological arousal. Um, this isn't sexual arousal, it's physiological arousal. And that can range from very, very low to very, very high. Um, and so when we think about patients with things like traumatic brain injuries, 
or even right hemisphere disorders, they can fluctuate between either being hypo aroused or hyper aroused. Um, uh, and then if we cross these variables, we can think that there, there are certain words that cluster in different parts of this space, this valence and arousal space. So if we hear a word like table, it has very, very neutral valence. We don't think of it as really positive or negative. And we really have very, it's very, very low arousal. It doesn't do much for us. But then there are other words that will, are uh, more consistent with a, with a feeling of reward, um, like chocolate, where you have, a, it's positively valent and a little bit more arousing. And then taxes, which is negatively valent and somewhat more arousing. What we know about cursing is that if you look in this space, if you plotted all English words in this valence arousal space, most of the curse words cluster in this range. Very, very high physiological arousal and very, very negatively valent. Um, so when we actually looked at that, when we plotted, this is the, on the left, this is 1100-ish uh, English words where we mark the taboo words. So this is fucking shit and dick and all of these words, they're, they're something, they're basically moving toward this quadrant of very high arousal um, and very negative emotion. Um, when, when we start talking about patients in a minute, we'll talk about the importance of that, um, particularly related to the left hemisphere disorders like aphasia where people have difficulties with emotion regulation. Um, this uh, other figure on the right is scatter plot representing basically the perfect spread between taboo and non-taboo words in this valence and arousal space. So if you plot, these are the top 50 um, um, least uh, taboo words in English, and these are, the, these are the top 50 of the most. And these are just plotted on their valence and arousal ratings from published norms. You can see there's a perfect separation. The curse words really, really separate out from other words. So there's something about this dimension, these dimensions of valence and arousal that give a lot of power to curse words. Um, but the story ends up being more complex than just valence and arousal, I think, and we'll visit that in just a second. Um, so um, uh, the interest, uh, interest in the psycholinguistics of taboo word processing, um, so to revisit back to this idea of what I saw clinically. So clinically, what I saw was patients with Alzheimer's disease, patients with TBI, would sometimes curse at you in a way that was meant to hurt you. Um, whereas patients with aphasia, I thought were very often, it was this almost out of frustration. So I developed this sort of hypothesis about, well, well something, there's something different about it. And when I look at the literature, um, there's basically two, uh, two modes of different kind, kinds of cursing that can happen. Um, and one, uh, this was this distinction between proposi use, propositional versus non-propositional language use. So propositional language use would be using, uh, using a semantically and syntactically specified, a word in a syntactically spe and synta semantically specified way, right? So if you wanted to say, it smells like shit, you're using shit in a propositional way. Um, I shit on the bed, it smells like shit. Um, he's a little shit. Like all the, basically shit is acting like a word. Whereas um, non-propositional language use, um, it, when you say, just say, when you just hit your finger with a hammer and you yell shit, you can think of this as not necessarily semantically or syntactically specified. It's more of a response cry. Um, and so, uh, so one thought is, at least uh, the aphasiologist Hewlings Jackson came up, um, really sort of um, hammered on this distinction of propositional language on the, on the left side of this axis, really being left hemisphere uh, mediated, whereas non-propositional language is lexicalized, stored as whole units, it's more automatic and reflexive um, and tends to be reactive response cries. So you have this dissociation and cursing between propositional language use, um, it smells like shit, he's a little shit, versus non-propositional language use, which would be uh, a response cry. Left hemisphere for propositional cursing, right hemisphere uh, is the main dissociation for non-propositional cursing. Um, so, um, I found this very, very simple processing model and adapted it a little to, to you know, basically what I observe in, in aphasia. Um, and I think it's useful for sort of understanding different types of cursing and why it happens. So um, this is adapted from Timothy Jay's work in 1999 on cursing. Um, so this idea of a stage model would be the first stage is that basically, you know, in someone cursing or not, would be that there's some, extra, there's some provocation or trigger. trigger. And that provocation can be intrinsic, can be inside yourself, or it can be induced by something outside in the environment, either another human or an environmental event. So um, uh, when we think about patients that we see in the clinic and when they curse, 
One thing that really, really sets off people with aphasia is when they become anomic and they start to struggle and they say, oh God, I know, I know, I know that word. Oh God, you know, and so they have this pinging of familiarity. They know they know it, but they can't retrieve it. And so that degree of anomia can be a provocation or trigger uh, that we see uh, eliciting cursing in aphasia. Other aspects moderate the amount of provocation that you feel. So whether it's someone from the opposite sex, their age, their appearance, a power differential, all of these things, all these factors conspire to influence the amount or severity of the provocation trigger. Second part is this idea that the trigger then elicits, uh, high, elicits physiological arousal. Right, and so this idea that you have this, your brain basically, your on switch is on and you're upregulated. Um, and then that, that um, feeling of arousal in some people with brain injury, particularly frontal lobe disorders, gets interpreted as anger. So you become hyper aroused, then you become in, almost instantaneously with that anger. And then the first uh, sort of, then some people at that point, almost they exit this pathway, they exit this language pathway uh, with a reflex, almost like a reflex arc. So you're provoked, you become hyper aroused in anger, you then you say, oh fuck, right? And so this would be what I think is happening in aphasia, right? Where you have someone's anomic, they become hyper aroused, and then they lack the inhibitory control um, to stop the cursing and it's a reflex arc goes out and people say fuck. The second pathway to cursing would be this idea that, that you can have, you're provoked, you become aroused, but then you have this um, executive control process that slows you down and it deliber it's, it's a conscious deliberation on what should I say, uh, I'll weigh the risk benefit of cursing, um, and then I'll either make a decision to consciously inhibit cursing um, or, or to just let it fly, right? And so then the final step is response planning and execution, right? And so this would be, okay, you know, I've decided one pathway. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop the F-bomb on this person. And then the second thing, you know, this response planning and execution would be like, how severe of a curse word is called for? Um, and then what, we, what should I actually say? So if you go all through this stage, you deliberate and then you, 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 fa you, you fail to inhibit and then you say, fuck you, um, you know, or, you know, you, you modify or you get something really creative um, and you curse propositionally. That would be this. And then if you inhibit it this way, you say, pardon me, sir. So this would be someone steps on your toe at the grocery store or something like that. Now it's, you know, a, a totally different game, but, you know, so this. So you can think of this as sort of a, a, a very crude processing model of uh, why people would curse. So part two would be how does that sort of what we know about the psycholinguistics of cursing map onto what we know about neurological disorders, right? And so um, we, you know, basically what studies of what we talked about so far is that peak, there's valence. Um, we know we can think of lots of people who have problems uh, either that are um, a, that problems with processing emotional valence and other disorders that involve pro, uh, uh, either hypo or hyper uh, arousal, uh, right? Hemisphere disorders um, involving apathy and hypo arousal and then TBI involving this fluctuation between hypo and hyper arousal. So um, again, one of the big, you know, masters of uh, cursing research in the 1800s uh, was, was John Hewlett Jackson. He was the, also the first editor of Brain. Uh, really did, you know, amazing work in just basically distinguishing what the, what the uh, a, a sort of foundational landmark for what the left hemisphere does and what the right hemisphere does in terms of emotion, emotional communication. So Hewlett Jackson knew, knew this, and basically this is his quote. He said that no doubt many apoplectic persons found in the streets are locked up for drunkenness. Because the policeman does not know that swearing is a very automatic process, which can persist under conditions produced by fatal brain lesions as well as by drink, right? And so Hewlett Jackson knew, uh, he was a clinical neurologist, um, that people after brain injury cursed a lot. Um, uh, and so um, we've, you know, when we talk about things like FTD now, frontal variant FTD, where people are potentially very often misdiagnosed or run into trouble with the law, um, it's not because they're drunk. Um, so uh, some of this basically this cursing emerges in the context of different neurological disorders. So let's talk about whether there's some uniting neurological principle that predicts whether someone's going to curse a lot or not. Um, so the first, some of the earliest research uh, and the most cited research goes back to Broca, Paul Broca. So Paul Broca, you know, very famous for reporting uh, patient Laborn um, and Laborn's uh, difficulties with speech fluency, 
um, uh, and most, you know, Psychology 101, Language one, Aphasia 101, um, you'll see the literature that basically ever, that uh, Laborn, people called him Tan or Tantan. Um, and many textbooks don't even reference the name Laborn, they'll just say Tantan, because uh, Laborn uh, was basically his, his uh, output was limited to this one neologism, Tan or Tantan. Um, but many of what, they, what the textbooks don't report is that Laborn also had this other neologism, which was uh, a, um, a curse word uh, or a phrase. Um, so Laborn said, uh, I don't speak French, but us and won't do it justice, but sacre nom de Dieu, which is like uh, sacred name of the Lord be, you know, sacred name of the Lord, almost like God damn it. But in the mid 1800s in France, this was heresy, right? You couldn't say this. Um, there's some debate about whether if this was Laborn or another patient, um, and we can we can talk about that. Um, Chris Code wrote a really interesting article on that. Um, but this idea that that Broca noticed that these patients with um, with very very severe non fluent aphasia cursed, um, um, but it really was just this almost this side note in Broca's observation. So he's clinically describing the phenotype of aphasia and really focused on motor aphasia, when we know it's Broca's aphasia, but, but also describe that these patients curse. So then afterwards, so after Broca's patients that, you know, noticed that, both, that probably both cursed, uh, in addition to, um, you know, having other neologisms, um, Hewling Jackson came along, um, and uh, I didn't know this before, but Hewling Jackson and Paul Broca met um, at a, uh, the British uh, Academy for the Advancement of Sciences in 1868, and really had this big debate on what the nature of aphasia is. Um, Hewling Jackson in 1878, um, he noted that, that basically out of his research and observations, um, came up with this distinction of propositional versus non-propositional uh, cursing. And this idea that the left hemisphere is important for aspects of propositional language use, which would be using language in ways to convey messages, using semantic and syntactic complexity, and all the aspects we are used to as language researchers. Whereas the right hemisphere is more, uh, more implicated in things like automatic, reflexive, uh, emotional language that involves that kind of cursing. Um, so uh, Henry Jackson, uh, this was this revolutionary dissociation in what he thought the hemispheres did. Um, what he argued is that there was intellectual language with the power to convey propositions, that's propositional language, and then emotional language with the ability to ex exhibit states of feeling. And Gilling Jackson really, really held, held sacred this, this dissociation between intellectual language and emotional language. Gilling uh, Jackson, this is his quote, they swear or ejaculate when excited and cannot repeat the words of the interde interjectional utterance when they try. This is in reference to people with global aphasia. And again, many of us you know, who are clinicians, we, we see this very, very often in the clinic when people, when people curse. And it's not something we ever learn about in school, like as speech pathologists, right? So we never, there's no units on cursing. Uh, we, it's just something we notice and try to move on from. Um, we can talk in the chat about, you know, basically like how do you, how do you redirect patients? Is it something you ignore? Do you, do you punish? That sort of thing of like how to basically move on from when people are cursing, but we'll revisit that. So this was Hewling Jackson's idea um, that he, you know, in the 1800s, people really, the aphasia world really started to get interested in, in, interested in cursing. Um, and uh, this also came along in, uh, uh, you know, more, got more developed when we, when uh, Tourette syndrome was discovered. Um, so the features of Tourette syndrome, uh, Tourette syndrome is a little bit different than we think of as in terms of global aphasia. Tourette syndrome, um, oh, cursing that is. So uh, the features of Tourette syndrome is that they're motor and phonic tics. So those phonic tics can include words, um, or they can include uh, sounds like grunting um, or squeaking. Um, more complex tics can include self-harm or insulting others. Um, uh, and then people have linked um, Tourette syndrome to a number of different um, uh, pathologies in the brain. So primarily people are interested in what the basal ganglia do and timing and motor timing. Um, and people have focused in, in on the, uh, the caudate as a motor break, basically this idea that in, in Tourette syndrome, this idea that something is, is not functioning correctly with the break. Now, it, the, the story ends up getting much, much more complex, but um, again, we can revisit that at the end. So 
In Tourette syndrome, in about um, the, the, the prevalence wi uh, wildly varies, but um, uh, coprolalia is present in about 8 to 40 percent of people with um, Tourette syndrome. Coprolalia is uh, literally uh, dung language, is the translation. It's the idea that people have this um, uh, very, very strong urge to curse. Um, and it's described as a premonitory urge. Basically, people have a premonition uh, that they are going to curse. Uh, and it's this urge that people with Tourette syndrome with coprolalia describe as building up like a sneeze. Like they say, it's, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming and really have a difficult time suppressing it. Um, and so, uh, so Tourette syndrome, an important thing is, it's, you know, we basically, people associate Tourette syndrome with uncontrolled cursing. And it's pretty rare, actually, you know, so basically, you know, 10% would be a normal amount of people with Tourette syndrome that experience coprolalia. Um, often along with coprolalia comes coprapraxia. So there have been a few cases that have actually looked at things. Coprapraxia would be, um, um, so when we talk about motor and phonic tics, people also uh, do obscene gestures. They'll grab, they'll give someone the finger, they'll grab their crotch. Um, um, so uh, they'll make, um, so this is, you know, hand, primarily hand gestures. Um, so copper ley and copper practice go together very often. Um, and uh, back to here, so uh, there have been cases where um, very, very severe uh, coprolalia have resolved when people get um, deep brain stimulation. And sort of the targets of deep brain stimulation that have resolved, and also for uh, when people take dopamine antagonists. Um, again, we'll revisit that at the end if people have questions. And so we've talked about aphasia, we talked about Tourette syndrome. Uh, the, other, uh, the other neurological disorder where there's lots of cursing is of course TBI. Um, so back to when we learned about executive function and uh, inhibitory control, uh, psychology 101 students, you have to learn about Phineas Gage. So quickly, briefly, so Harlow, um, uh, John Harlow was the physician who treated uh, Phineas Gage. Phineas Gage was, of course, a railroad foreman who was, uh, this is his picture here, um, with the tamping iron that went through. Um, and so he was tamping, uh, he was working on the railway. Uh, this tamping iron uh, exploded. And um, this, uh, this from this Van Horn paper, it recreated, uh, it recreated the pathway of the iron rod up, um, on, uh, up here, and it obliterated his left eye and came out the top of his head and it landed far away. So um, Harlow's descriptions, uh, so then uh, Phineas Gage, of course, survived and within a month was back. Um, so we have basically all these people who reported on knowing Phineas Gage before and after. One of his biggest problems related to gross profanity. So he, you know, this is Harlow's description, case description of Phineas Gage was first, he would, he's fitful or reverent, indulging at times in the grossest profanity, manifesting but little deference for his fellows, impatient of restraint. And so this idea with uh, Harlow noticed one of the things that happened with Phineas Gage afterward was that he cursed uncontrollably, uh, whereas before he would almost never curse. Um, so, uh, so this is, uh, and people have linked, um, oops, uh, people have linked this specific, there's a big debate also around Phineas Gage on whether, um, whether the rod actually obliterated left orbital frontal cortex only, or whether it crossed both hemispheres. But in general, people are saying in here, what you have is cursing evolving in the context of um, real sort of very, very frontal. So ventromedial, uh, frontal cortex, orbital frontal cortex here, and more on the left side than the right. Uh, when we talk about TBI that is in, in acceleration, deceleration injuries like you would see in a car accident, then you have more of a bilateral distribution of damage. But in Phineas Gage, it tended to be, uh, the, the, one of the arguments is it looks to be primarily left hemisphere. Okay. And then the last neurological disorder we'll talk about um, where cursing has changed is right hemisphere damage. And curiously, people with right hemisphere stroke tend to curse e either not at all um, or very, very little. Their cursing actually drops to very near li little. Um, and so this ends up being one of the great mysteries in, in uh, cognitive neuroscience of language, right? What does the right hemisphere do uh, that you could, if you knock out the right hemisphere, uh, that you curse uh, very, very little or not at all? Um, so, and briefly, you know, as a brief summary, um, the 
disorders, neurological disorders where people curse more, would be less brain damage, where people have aphasia, um, even uh, global aphasia, and then TBI and things like behavioral variant or frontal variant FTD, where people have lots and lots of orbital frontal damage, particularly me uh, ventromedial orbital frontal here, and then Tourette syndrome, where the primary areas that people are looking at as dysfunctional are the basal ganglia, um, particularly areas like the caudate here, where I'm highlighting. So these are the, the disorders um, where people curse a lot um, and they curse in different ways. Uh, and this is the brain pathology. So the idea of like, you know, what many people here uh, are used to doing with lesion symptom mapping would be like, wh where's the area of commonality uh, that is really predicting cursing? And really the only answer to that is that, um, is that it's, the, it's that people when they curse, a lot, they curse um, something about the right hemisphere as, as being rep as basically this cursing lexicon. So quickly, I'll sort of go back to this. Um, other conditions, there have been other, many other neurological conditions where uh, extensive or uh, unusual levels of cursing occur. Alzheimer's disease um, and other forms of dementia are very, very common that people will curse a lot more, even particularly when they're doing like things like sundowning. So in the early evening, when they become agitated, the people with Alzheimer's disease curse. Schizophrenia also, uh, it's been thought that people curse a lot more in terms of uh, responsivity to uh, hallucinations, uh, persecutory hallucinations. Epilepsy, this is, there've been a few case studies reported of when people have very, very severe seizures. Um, question of whether it's ictal or post-ictal cursing um, is open. OCD um, has been studied in terms of cursing um, and then also related to Tourette syndrome. Um, where there is, uh, people are looking at the basal ganglia here. Behavioral variant or frontal variant FTD, um, so patients that are high, uh, patients with this tend to be hypersexual, hyperoral, and curse a lot. Um, paraplegia also, older adults with major depression, and then pediatric developmental disabilities. So these are conditions, these are all conditions that have basically abnormal level, uh, levels of cursing. So um, this taxonomy briefly is this idea that there are two types of curse, two primary types of cursing. One is propositional, which, which uses curse words at just like syntactically and semantically specified in language. So patients that do a lot more propositional cursing in, with neurological disorders include FTD, TBI, schizophrenia, Alzheimer's disease, and other neuropsychiatric disorders. And then patients that show more non-propositional cursing after a brain injury, these are the patients that do more response cries. Um, uh, aphasia, so this is left hemisphere damage when people have global aphasia or Broca's aphasia. TBI, TBI actually shows both. Um, so these are patients that have an external provocation or trigger, you step on their foot at the grocery store, you know, they might say fuck um, because they're, they're initially responding reflexively, but then they're gonna go to propositional language and call you, you know, you motherfucker, now I'm gonna, now I'm gonna fight you, right? And so other, asp other uh, disorders, so Tourette syndrome, it's this sort of real murky area of whether cursing's propositional versus non-propositional, because in Tourette syndrome, the cursing can be very, very specific um, and very um, uh, almost tailored to the individual. Um, so, you know, per person with Tourette syndrome, um, uh, the copper lele can be like very, very targeting a person's physical characteristics. And so people argue, is that propositional or non-propositional? Uh, so that's it. So basically, again, you have this taxonomy between proposition, propositional cursing and non-propositional cursing, and these are the disorders that really exemplify both. So in the last, I think I've got like eight more minutes um, or 10 more minutes, um, we'll talk about some work that we've done in basically trying to modulate cursing behavior, right? So um, one of the really, really, some, some of the interesting things that we talked about, and then again, like I'm very, very, I'm very, very curious about cursing because as a, as a student of speech language pathology clinician, I noticed that it happens a lot, but I also noticed that there's, it's not in any textbook and it's never really been, it's never characterized as a distinct communicative disorder. So there are no diagnostic criteria for what constitutes neurogenic cursing, right? When does someone, when does someone curse too much? Um, but actually, if you end up talking to patients when they, after they curse, they are, con they very, very commonly will apologize. Um, and they'll, they'll often cry, particularly patients with aphasia. So they'll, you know, they'll say, fuck, and then they'll start to cry. And they'll say, oh, I never said, I never, you know, I never said that. That's not the kind of person I am. So it really is for some people acting almost as this reflex arc. 
um, that is that, um, so that would be in aphasia. When we talk about things like traumatic brain injury, people, people will describe, um, um, people will describe this, that, that, that they experience social or occupational impairment from the inability to suppress it. You see it the most in, in uh, people with coprolalia with Tourette syndrome. So they'll, they'll really sort of say like, it's, it's very, very debilitating. It's, it's one of the most debilitating aspects because people think they attribute volition as if, you know, this idea is like, as if I'm trying to harm them. Um, the other aspect of neurogenic cursing in Tourette syndrome is that it's, it's this very, very constant, it's this very frequent um, uh, fodder for humor and movies and, and media. So this idea is we make fun of people. Um, we make fun of people who have coprolalia. We make fun of people with Tourette's. Uh, a very, very similar uh, phenomenon happens with stuttering, right? So stuttering is, is depicted very humorously in film and people who stutter are depicted as being somewhat strange. Um, and so this idea is people who have coprolalia and really cannot suppress it um, will very, very often describe that, they, that it's one of the worst aspects of it. Despite that, there's really, really no, again, like as a field of speech, speech language pathology and neurolinguistics, there's no formal metrics of, you know, of cursing of, and how much it impairs people and how common it is. Because again, it's something, it's almost like this nuisance behavior that happens as we're treating patients that we tend to ignore. Um, okay, so um, there are, uh, so in addition, basically we, we you know, so this first thing about neurogen cursing is people will, will say it, they'll, they'll describe it as socially impairing. They'll describe it as a nuisance behavior. Um, uh, but there are a limited range of behavioral treatments. So one, we can't measure it. And two, we really don't know how to treat it, right? So what is it? So, you know, for people who have kids or partners that, who curse a lot, right? So what works for getting someone to curse less? You know, as a, as a parent of a teen, there's really not much that you can do. You can, you can punish, you can forbid, but you're really gonna have very, very minimal success, right? So punishing and saying, don't say that to someone with TBI after they curse, uh, any clinician will tell you that really doesn't work. Um, there have been, a, there are a limited range of treatments. So deep brain stimulation has worked at improving uh, intractable coprolalia in very, very severe uh, threat syndrome in a few cases, um, and that punishment is ineffective. So there's a need to basically study this, study this phenomenon, the neurological basis of cursing in more depth. There's a need to understand it's, uh, it as a distinct communication disorder and to be able to measure it and to be able to treat it. Um, and so, some of the research that we've done um, is basically sort of trying to trying to throw darts at this problem that's very very complex. Um, so when when this earlier work that I've described that I basically says what are the predictors of cursing? It's some you know we can think of it cursing as a recipe right and making a chocolate cake. Uh, there's a little bit of sound structure, the sound of a word. Uh, you're sensitive to that. There's a little bit of the semantics of the word right. So does it deal with genitalia or sex or any, or you know something like that. And then does the word arouse you or you know, physiologically arouse you and, and have negative valence? So you think about this like when you're in health, in health class in high school and you'd send, you know, the teacher would say the word penis and you'd immediately start laughing, right? Or sort of like try to inhibit this giggle. But basically you have these words that when you hear them, you, you spike your physiological arousal. You really can't suppress it from happening. Now the case would be, the question is, if you have um, level problems with emotion regulation, and arousal regulation, you can't, you can't inhibit that giggling. You just start laughing and then you start cursing. Um, frontal, lobe, frontal, frontal lobe disorders that do that can produce um, uh, get a, great, a great deal of difficulty inhibiting that behavior. So in the study to, that we did, um, we were interested in this idea of the, we've got a left hemisphere doing something for cursing and a right hemisphere. Um, and what we wanted to see is whether TDCS or neurostimulation to the cathodal stimulation to the right hemisphere, frontal lobe, prefrontal cortex, could um, perturb that cursing behavior. So if we think that cursing tends to be le right lateralized more, what can we do to sort of like downregulate that function? So our hypothesis was that inhibition of the right pre prefrontal cortex would diminish physiological arousal experience during cursing. So what does that mean? So what, right PFC will diminish physiological arousal. What we can think of is that patients with right prefrontal damage, what do they look like when you see them clinically? Typically what they look like is extremely lethargic and apathetic and hypo aroused, right? And so with that low level of arousal, even when they hear a curse word, it doesn't, 
push them to some threshold where they're going to where they're going to feel the arousal enough to curse. Right. So the thought is, you know, maybe that we could suppress the level of arousal by stimulating the right hemisphere um, and neurotypical uh, adults. So for people who don't know TDCS, transcranial direct current stimulation, a type of uh, non-invasive brain stimulation, we are operating. We operated under the uh, under what's called the AECI hypothesis, and this is the idea that you have. Uh, anodal stimulation to the brain under these electrodes uh, produces excitation um, or basically um, um, depolarizes colonies of neurons under this. Now that's really, really uh, controversial, um, but we don't have time to really talk about it now. And, uh, talk to Julius Friedrich and he could tell you about it. Um, but cathodal, and so cathodal stimulation would be inhibition. So the idea is if we place the cathode over the right prefrontal cortex, maybe we can inhibit either emotion, uh, emotion, uh, emotional swings or arousal that would impact your, your, your basically the amount of sensation that you feel while you curse. Um, so in this study we modeled, uh, we did what, uh, our electrode montage in one group, uh, we gave them right anodal and left cathodal, and this is the uh, the group that basically what we are arguing is we're trying to, well, our hypothesis is we're trying to get this area not so active so that people uh, experience less arousal while they're cursing. Um, so this was the group um, uh, that got this stimulation uh, that we think was going to be, uh, be different in terms of, um, in terms of their uh, response during cursing. Um, and then our dependent measure, so these were the two groups. We had this one group that got stimulation in this sort of montage where we thought we we're gonna, we're gonna downregulate the right hemisphere and upregulate the left. And then we have another comparison group that just got the opposite polarity. Um, we have two groups. And so one of the things about responsivity to cursing is that uh, there's lots of individual differences in how, how cursing will be, you'll, you'll arouse, right? So, um, uh, so we, but we, well, we use standardized, we use strategies Stratified random assignment. Basically, the idea is when we we got measures of their age, their frequency of cursing, religiosity. I think disgust. And for every person that was well matched on across all these variables, we put them in one group. And if they're with the next person that was matched, we put them in group B. So the idea is we're trying to demographically match the groups on all these variables that can influence your arousal when you say a curse word or you hear a curse word. Okay. So our dependent measure was pu the pupil response as people were reading the word. And so if you, people don't know what pupillometry does, um, pupillometry is an index, certainly your, your pupil dilates in darkness, constricts in brightness, um, but also uh, your pupil dilates parametrically um, in tandem with your level of physiological arousal. Um, so, uh, you know, again, if you're watching a curse, uh, if you're watching a horror movie and, you know, Freddy Krueger is about to jump out but hasn't jumped out yet and you're building the suspense, your pupils will keep dilating and dilating and dilating as a function of arousal. So it's a good physio implicit physiological measure of how aroused are, do you become when you hear a word. So if you hear a word like table, you can measure the pupil response to table. And if you hear a word, you know, like motherfucker, you're going to get much, you're going to predict that you're going to see much more dilation of the pupil for the, for the more physiologically arousing word. Uh, so we, we, are, we had two groups, uh, 32 people, 16 to a group. Um, uh, they read aloud um, curse words and non-curse words um, as we track their pupil responses continuously uh, using an eye-link eye tracker. Uh, these, you know, basically this idea is that they couldn't have had, they're, they're a normal group of neurotypical young adults. Um, we processed their pupil data. We, we looked at the reaction time uh, afterward. We looked at, you know, what, what, what we did some data fidelity. We had to eliminate one item, uh, uh, conolingus, we had to eliminate because uh, people, uh, these were a lot of like Temple undergrads, uh, Temple University undergrads, and no one, a lot of people just didn't know what that word meant. Um, so we, we eliminated it post hoc. Um, and then we did, you know, other basically standard data cleaning. And we used uh, Jason Geller and Dan Merman's gazer package of R. If you're doing pupilometry, it's a, it's a wonderful resource. Dan Merman's here, so uh, thank him. Um, and to process the pupil data. So what we find is at least in reaction time, pre-post stimulation, oh, so I should say that's the, the design of this is that we, people come into the lab, they sit in the eye tracker and they read curse words and neutral words um, as we track their pupil responses. 
then we stimulate them, we electrically stimulate their brain, and then they come back to the eye tracker again and they read another set of curse words and neutral words. And what we're looking at is the level of arousal after you've been stimulated on a certain part of your brain. So reaction time, it's all over the place pre-post. Whether you get cathodal, anodal to the left or right, there's really no, we couldn't really discern any particular inherent pattern in the reaction time data. So reaction time isn't necessarily a good measure here. But what we found is, is there is a strong, uh, there is a strong interaction and pupillary amplitude. And I'll sort of walk you through that. And so the group that got anodal stimulation to the right hemisphere showed very, very little difference in cursing pre-post stimulation. Um, and so this is basically what we would predict, right? So this is the amount that the pupil dilated uh, after, before stimulation and after stimulation when people had the anodal to the right hemisphere. Um, the other group was the one that we thought might, might do it, right? And so this is exactly what we found is this what we predicted. If you look at their pupil dilation before you give them stimulation to the right hemisphere, before you start, you know, basically turning down the volume on the right hemisphere, um, you get this level of dilation. And then afterward, you get a, this is a, a statistically significant difference in the post group. Um, so there's this interaction between the, the polarity of the TDCS stimulation um, and uh, the, uh, whether the word is a curse word or not. So, let me just wrap up. Um, there are some limitations to that, which I can I can talk about uh, um, afterward. Um, there's also the the two papers that we wrote on this, the TDCS paper and the initial predictors paper, are available for download on our website. One was in Psychonomic Bulletin. The other was in Brain Language. Just came out like two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Uh, they're both. Uh, I, you can either contact me or they're available on my lab website for download. Um, so quickly, so the general discussion is one, I just, you know, sort of want to impress upon you this idea that like what we see clinically is, is, is possibly a communicative disorder of legitimate neuroscientific and clinical inquiry. It's something that we see clinically all the time, but we sort of dismiss as a nuisance. But in fact, it's something I think we need to measure. Uh, we need to measure its quality, uh, impact on quality of life. Uh, we need to develop a, a measurement scale of looking at this, um, and then we need to figure out how we can treat this behaviorally. I think you know the potential for integrating TDCS is is, is promising, but trying to figure out what exactly we're regulating with that, and, and you know how we how an, uh, disorders of emotion regulation and arousal regulation impact cursing um, uh, remains you know area really really sort of new frontier in in language research and particularly clinical language research um, so uh, so these are sort of future directions with the develop a scale develop a model of why people a more sophisticated path model of why people curse in neurological disorders and then to figure out how to we can start you know intervening for people who really sort of experience impairment um, and, you know as a function of this um, so that is all I have for today. I wanted to thank, uh, again, thank Professor Dan Oden and Friedrichsen and to all of you um, and to uh, the great people in my lab um, and our collaborators. Uh, so Dirk, uh, you can, you guys, oh, so audience, feel free to fire away. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jamie. That was awesome. Really nice. Talk. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. And I, I can tell you, I was in a constant state of arousal throughout. Ah, oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> also be because I was uh, frantically monitoring to make sure that no one was being naughty like that. Like oh, my God. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm 99% certain that was Julius Friedrichsen doing that last time, but I, I can't prove anything. That's not going to be <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> questions online. I wanted to start, um, uh, um, and uh, thank you for the audience. You, you please feel free to ask your questions via the chat box. Um, I will read them out to Jamie. Jamie, I'm assuming you cannot see the questions on your chat, right? I can't. Well, let me, do you want me? I, I, oh, I, might be. I can read them out to you. I will do that. Okay, good. So the first question I wanted to start with was one that I also had and is maybe even more one of, uh, of clarification. Um, in the graph you showed towards the end for your TDCS, mm -hmm. um, it seems as if the two groups are very different pre-stimulation. Yeah, yeah. That's a, What's up with that? Yeah, that is a great question. So that's something we need to replicate. Uh, we need to replicate it again. So um, anytime you do a pupillometry study, there's going to be random variability at the baseline, even though they're pretty well matched in things like disgust and gender and all these other things. 
So there was a difference, there was a, this baseline difference that was just weird uh, that we can't attribute to like some, any sort of variable that we know influences cursing, like a differences in gender distribution, differences in religiosity, things like that. So the question is, I don't know. I think, uh, you know, the fact that this idea is, is such a small study, 16 and 16, way, way, way too small. Um, when we get to weaknesses, you need to do a much, much bigger study to get those baseline differences, um, uh, you know, uh, under control. So really what we're interested though in this is this idea of change, regardless of where you started in the baseline. Um, so, you know, both of those factors are at play. Much, much bigger study needed to get really, really close in the base, to bring that variance down. And this, this question was also brought up by uh, Kirana Tsapkini, yep. who actually asks a uh, follow-up question, but I'm, I'm assuming you did not have a no stimulation group, right? Because she we did not have a sham. Yeah, so when I go back here, let's see. Uh, there was a difference with um, that group if you didn't have it. Sorry. For some reason, I'm not able to back. Uh, yeah, so one of our, when we talk about weaknesses, one of the weaknesses we had, it was a, there's a no, sh there was no sham group. So what we use is the opposite polarity um, as, the, as the comparison group, but there was really no sham group. Okay. And so, um, uh, so yeah, I mean, this is, this is, you know, again, the highlights the need to do a much, much bigger study with this. Um, so the- I think you are actually able to go back. There's at the bottom of your screen, there should be two arrows. They're not part of PowerPoint. Yeah. Oh yeah, here we go. Um, oh, thanks. Thanks, Dirk. Um, so, yeah, so, uh, so Karana, we're, we're uh, so, you know, one of the things that was one of the weaknesses identified. So we really do need a, new, a true sham group. Um, the other thing is I'm you know, very, very upfront about this idea. When you hit the right hemisphere, you're changing so many things at once, right? You're, you're, you're changing, you know, so what do we know clinically for people who see people with right hemisphere disorders in the clinic? Tend to be apathetic, tend to be really lethargic, tend to be very literal. Um, all those things that Connie Tompkins describes. Um, and so, um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, so these are, these, this is, you know, some big, so, you know, again, back to this idea of like, when we hit the right hemisphere, what are we changing? Are we changing arousal levels? Are we changing emotion regulation? And then, uh, then again, back to Hewlings Jackson, or are we changing access to non-propositional language? Or sort of like this idea that some other researchers in cursing have argued that the, there's a right hemisphere cursing lexicon, that basically we store curse words in the right hemisphere apart from other aspects of language. So all three of those things are possible loci for when you perturb the right hemisphere that you could be changing. Um, so really to figure out specificity would be, you know, one, you need anatomical specificity. What are we, you know, with TDCS, with electrodes that are as big as we use, you really, you know, you were changing the whole right prefrontal cortex, um, but, you know, really sort of specifying in, like, what is that? Yeah. Another question um, was asked by Amit Amor, uh, more about the use of, uh, of cursing. Um, what about using fuck as a linguistic filler and phrase boundary as in the New York street slang? So does, it doesn't seem to be triggered by provocation, but more by social linguistic factors. Yeah, there's really, really fascinating work on that. And, you know, this idea that the cursing, cursing is unlike, you know, many other aspects of the lexicon. A curse, a curse word can be a noun, can be a, a verb, can be, you can use it also. So it has such dynamic syntactic flexibility. Um, I don't know. I, you know, I don't know. There, I know that there's a ton of literature on that recently on the sociolinguistics of it, like what, you know, and variability and homogeneity across languages and dialects. But I don't know. Um, I don't know specifically about use, use of it as a filler. Amit and I actually had a quick email chat about it when, while you were talking, and I said, well, I think it seems to me that the, the valence is also different in those cases, right? So the word doesn't have the same negative load, perhaps. Um, yeah, and that's, that's a possibility. So one of these things that really kind of like when we talk about valence, I've talked to people that are like valence is everything, right? Or valence and, and arousal or everything. But there are lots of words that are very, very negatively valent and highly physiological arousal that aren't curse words. So when we think about words, when we get, when we look at the ratings of words in that quadrant, in that negative valent high arousal quadrant, there's words like welfare and AIDS and sodomy. And these words are not curse words, but they have that same effect that you do when you read a word in health class in high school, where you're like, whoa, <laughs> um, like it, you initially ping, um, but they're not curse words. And so 
you know, this gets back to this idea that curse words, there's something really, really special about it that I think goes beyond valence and arousal. Um, but you know what it is, I don't know. You know, why is it that with that we that you know, a word that like welfare, people have really, really negative associations become really physiological arousal. But when you drop a pan on your foot, you don't yell welfare. Um, but I don't know, I don't know. It seems, it seems there's something specific about some uh, curse words as well, right? So Amit also followed up and said, what's always been interesting to me is that people that speak like that use fuck in multiple word categories and appear to insert it with some syntactic regularity. I think that's something that is common to yeah. a particular word. There's a few others that you can basically use as a verb, as a noun, and whatever in whatever context you like. Yeah, I mean, this gets to this idea that, that curse words really have just amazing syntactic flexibility that can be used in anything. I mean, so, and again, we're all, you know, when we're talking about now is normal language use. We're not talking about neurogenic cursing. And this, this, it gets back to this range, like there's nothing inherently pathological about, about cursing. You know, all of us know people who curse a lot, um, uh, but you know, it's the ability to inhibit it on demand and to also change your linguistic register. So, you know, not being able to basically not curse in front of people that are important is one of the big markers of neurogenic cursing um, and like the ability to change. Leanne Spell asks, uh, and, and you did a, uh, talk about this a little bit, but maybe you can talk a little bit more about your thoughts on clinical strategies for decreasing cursing uh, in patients, as this can be very distressing to patients themselves and to their families. I know you addressed it, but maybe you can talk a little bit more. About yeah, I'm it. super glad. You, you know, and this is really one of where I want to talk with clinicians because I don't, you know, beyond like trying to figure out why it happens. And I think really, again, like this idea of this reflex arc of basically this, you know, people experience an extreme level of frustrations from being anomic or not being able to get a word out. And then this idea of it just sort of reaches this threshold and then you just basically explodes. Um, some of this, you know, it depends on the disorder, right? So I can think of clinical strategies where, where you would want to, where you would want to get people, basically this idea of like metacognition and TBI, right? A bit, being able to get people to, to recognize and self-regulate when they're going into the red and being able to sort of step back and remove themselves from a situation, right? So some of this cursing relates to this idea that people just, you know, their, their threshold for anger and arousal is very, is lowered and they kick into that much higher. And so this gets to these ideas, like how do you structure a treatment session for TBI that like, you know, very, very short first, distributed learning, get people to start recognize when they're going into the red and getting out of control and then to sort of step back. But that would be a very different clinical strategy from someone with aphasia who doesn't necessarily have, you know, they have more, more language problems, but less, you know, emotion. I, it's not really fair to say less emotion dysregulation because, people with left hemisphere stroke tend to have lots of emotion dysregulation problems. So I think your question is great. Uh, and I think it really depends. I think there's not going to, I think there's going to be different strategies for different disorders. And again, this relates to this idea of why you want this feeling of like cursing feels really, really different when someone with TBI curses at you or FTD versus but with stroke aphasia, um, where they curse and they apologize and they're cursing it really as a response cry, just like you would if you hit your hand with a hammer. Um, which is different, I think, than TBI. Stacy Fritz asks, uh, do you have to control for the amount of cursing in normal life, so where it could arouse some people more than others? Yeah, that's another great question. So um, there's this law in psychophysics called the law of initial values. And what the, that law predicts is that if, you, let's say, if you have a really, really high accelerated heart rate and Freddy Krueger jumps out you know, at you, you're not going to have that much of a uh, of an elevated response relative to if you started with a low heart rate and Freddy Krueger jumped out at you, right? So this idea of the level that you curse and the amount that you that it really sort of shocks you um, makes the big difference. Now the question is, what level of difference does that make in neurological disorders? I don't know. I think that's somewhat out the window um, because again, you can get people who curse a lot who are perfect, you know, who were you know choir boys before. Um, after they've had a car accident and had a you know very very severe injury, and it can go the other way as well, right? So someone who was cursed like a sailor before they have a right hemisphere disorder, then they don't curse at all. Um, so that those baseline differences, I don't know how they interact with, you know, basically your pre-morbid disposition for cursing. There's a lot of um, 
differences in that premorbid disposition for cursing that fall under the normal range of variability. We all know people who curse a ton and when they shouldn't, um, but who aren't neurologically impaired. I don't know what you have against sailors, but okay. Uh, well, yeah, <laughs> they curse a lot. They're known, that's it. <laughs> I don't know. We have a question from Brenda Rapp, uh, who is wondering about the evidence for a, a, a separate lexicon, so with separal, separate neural substrates, for curse and non-curse words. So for example, is there evidence that curse words induce different kinds of speech errors than non-curse words or other types of evidence for separate? Yeah, that's a great question, Brenda. I mean, so again, this depends. So not a lot has been looked at like with error, error type analysis, but if we look at things like, if we think of like there's two types of cursing, one is this reflexive non-propositional cursing, it would predict that basically these are lexicalized forms, they're stored as whole units. So there's it, almost like, you know, uh, like idioms are, or, or um, overlearned phrases like counting ones. So with people with aphasia, you know, a sure way to get them to show, to clinically to show that they can actually produce speech is to have them count, say one, to count one to 10, or say, you know, sing happy birthday or something, these very, very overlearned phrases. So errors with those tend to be much more diminished. So if you say fuck, like in the context of hitting uh, hitting your finger with a hammer, um, my understanding is you're far less likely to produce a speech error than if you're using it propositionally, as in like, you know, you know he fucked the whatever, right? So using it semantically or syntactically. But I don't know. I don't think that's ever been looked at. I think, you know, one of the big arguments for it being a separate lexicon was just by default, the fact that you can have lots and lots of left hemisphere dance. You can be globally aphasic lose all aspects of access to other aspects of language and the lexicon, but still curse. The only thing you can say is fuck, or the only thing you can say is shit. So people have argued that's evidence for this fact that cursing has to be stored apart from other aspects of the lexicon. Now that's really, really a leap. Uh, and it's really almost like this, basically this logic based on subtraction, right? If, if all other aspects of the language are, are lost when you have a bad left hemisphere injury, that must mean that, that it's in the right hemisphere. But there's lots of other more uh, sort of nuanced answers to that, right? So uh, even more simple one would be, you know, maybe you lose, if, we, if all this frontal damage causes it, maybe it's just this, this idea that you, 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 the brakes are off. You take the inhibitory brakes off and whatever you're thinking, you just say it, right? Which would be more of an executive problem than a language problem. So, you know, that, I think that some of the evidence for that being a, se a separate lexical entries is pretty weak. And I would argue probably not right. Yeah. Um, we have a question from Emma Hives, um, which uh, again goes to your experiment. I was curious how long the effect lasts from the right hemisphere PFC stimulation. We didn't, so uh, the way we did it was we gave people two milliamps for 20 minutes, um, but we, and the, there's one of the, big mysteries in TDCS. And there's a lot of people who are like pros at TDCS in this audience who, who can jump in and correct me if I'm wrong. But there's really a, a very little known about how long the, ref the refractory period is, like how long the treatment effects last. Some people have argued they can last 45 minutes or an hour. Some people argue there's, and basically it's, it's not clear. So the way we did this was right after, right toward the end of stimulation, we had people read these 150 words like like within a minute of ending the stimulation. So I don't know if we were, you know, refractory. I don't know. I don't know how long it lasts. Um, when, when people who do this treatment research in aphasia and use TDCS, they'll often look at like long-term potentiation that happens over multiple sessions doing it. And so this idea is you're not necessarily interested in promoting like a, win a long, 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 long window where you see these effects, but you're interested in the synergy of pairing the, um, the stimulation with some behavioral treatment. But again, I, Karana is great. Um, um, you know, there's lots of people here who know a lot more than I do about refractory or, or that window where you get better effects. Um, also related from uh, Natalie uh, Kachinik. Uh, has mm -hmm. anybody done a similar complementary hemispheric TMS study, complementary in parentheses, where right hemisphere TMS may increase cursing and left hemisphere TMS reduce cursing. So is there, a, is there a TMS study that does basically what you I don't know, about, you know, so we know so little about real, you know, anatomical targets for this. And again, this gets back to the specificity, right? So I was thinking like, if you do a TMS study, 
you know, so one of the one of the things that we did, why we did this as a TDCS study is one is we have a, a stimulator, right? That's the most easy one. But the two is that we really don't have specific anatomical hypotheses about what areas would you hit in the right hemisphere that you could stimulate. So we threw the kitchen sink at the whole right hemisphere to see if, you know, modulating a bunch of things at once. I think if you want, so I don't know of any TMS studies that have, I don't know of any neurostimulation studies that have done this. Um, but TDCS was good because it's it smooths out the stimulation area, whereas TMS, you're doing a much more focal stimulation. So my thought would be you could do TMS if you had specific hypotheses about anatomical targets, um, but we really didn't, right? So there could be something like if you hit, you know, dor right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, you might get inhibition, or if you hit X, you might, I, I don't know, uh, but I don't know of any. It's a good question. I mean, now, now I should say that there have been these, these case studies of deep brain stimulation, where leads are placed in the thalamus, leads are placed in the basal ganglia, and then people are looking at, uh, I don't know if Shlomit's meets here, but the, the cingulate cortex. So uh, depending on where there are patients who with, you know, very, very severe coprolalia who've had deep brain stimulation, who almost stop cursing entirely. Um, so, but that's in more sort of deep subcortical structures. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just browsing down. Uh, we have a question from D. Blackett. Um, could the reduction in pupil dilation after stimulation be due to reading curse words a second time and desensitization to them over time? So yeah, no, another, mm -hmm, yeah, another great question. So this idea that like, if you say fuck, like the first time you say it, you're gonna be like, oh my God, I can't believe I said that. And then you say it the second time, eh, it doesn't have that big of a kick, right? And so the idea is you're predicting some degree of like, almost like repetition priming. You're gonna get a, a diminished effect the second time you say it. The idea would be like, we're expecting that, but it's the, it's the other group that gives you that, that difference, right? So if the difference between pre-post is much more in one group than the other, both groups are getting the repeated presentation of it. They're saying fuck twice. Um, uh, but if one group shows more of a, of a difference, then, then we, at least from experimental method standpoint, we kind of assume that the effects are related to the stimulation. But again, that's a that's an assumption and a difficult one, given the fact that there are baseline differences between our groups. Um, thank you. The next question is from Michaela Gibson. Do you see increased cursing in patients with anosognosia? Oh God. Well, you know, so we, if we think like who's likely to have anosognosia, right? And so primarily anosognosia happen. I mean, so what I, and again, there are probably some neurologists on here who know a lot more than I do about this, but my thought is that anosognosia and neglect fair, are fairly common together and they're fairly uh, linked to the right hemisphere more than the left. And so when I talked about this before, this idea that people with right hemisphere disorders tend to curse less, my thought is that people with anosognosia, if they have it right hemisphere and right hemisphere damage and neglect, would probably curse less. But I don't know that it's been looked at. Um, I don't know of any research that looked at. But I very well could. I mean, this is again like a lot of this is based on what I saw clinically as a, as a speech pathologist in my early career. So neurologists see anosognosia a lot more than than SLPs do because we again we don't see right hemisphere disorders as much because they have you know there's this selection bias people with right hemisphere disorders feel better than they did before and they don't really come for treatment as much so it's a good question I don't know um, do people who you know see stroke patients like what's the incidence of anosognosia in left hemisphere disorders I don't know I don't so know. I'm I I'll put that out to the audience I I, I there might be a better better answer. My thought would be if it's right hemisphere and anosognosia from that, it's probably that they curse less. But then I'll go also, you know, the profile of that is right hemisphere to say patients tend to look lethargic and, and are hypo aroused a lot. Um, so I don't know. We have a question from Ellen. I have no last name. Uh, yeah, I, wonder, good. I wonder if pairing stimulation with some sort of inhibitory task would increase effects. Yeah, no, that's a, a great question. I mean, so, you know, one of the things to make this functional, like, is it inhibitory control um, or is it, you know, emotion dysregulation? And and I don't know. So, Ellen, what would be the, you know, sort of task? Would it be like a flanker task or having people do, 
Um, you know, so the other thing, I mean, so you can think clinically, like, you know, that might, it, as a way of saying, like, okay, if all of our attention goes to how angry we are, or, you know, how emotionally dysregulated we are, but we're doing this secondary dual task, maybe that makes you less, uh, less likely to go into the red uh, and the curse. I don't know. It's, I mean, it's actually a really good question, but I don't, I don't know the answer to it. Um, so again, this gets to this idea of specificity. We don't really know what we modulated, whether it was inhibition, whether it was emotion regulation, or whether it was non-propositional language. Probably not non-propositional language, I don't think. And the question came from Ellen Riley. So, oh, Ellen Riley, yeah. Uh, hi, Ellen. <laughs> um, I think a really interesting question from Kritika uh, Balasu Brahmanian. Uh, can the diminished effects due to repetition be used as a part of a cognitive therapy to invoke a kind of semantic satiation? So this oh, would probably help with propositional cursing where the semantics plays a bigger role. That's great. Uh, that's a great question. Vote, so, right? Or you change the... Yeah, I don't know. My thought is no, because patients with global aphasia curse constantly. And this idea is like we, we've done a little bit of... We, we presented... Um, we presented at Neurobiology Language on a, a single case study of, uh, uh, pup we did pupil responses in a person who cursed a lot with left hemisphere aphasia. And we looked at how his pupils were, were has, how his pupils dilated to curse words and non-words and anatomical matched body parts. So basically it was like, if, we, if the patient heard the word dick, then he had a control word like penis, right? And so this idea is that it's, it's, it's anatomical, anatomical, it's matched all these things and then a non-word. And what he showed was very, his pupil responses for, for curse words were very, very low relative to even non-words and other words. Basically curse words like she showed very little arousal when he would hear them. And so, you know, the thought is it could be this repetition effect. He hears them all the time, he hears himself saying them, he says them himself, he really doesn't experience that much arousal. And so, I don't know, I, I you know, Clinically, again, like week after week, when you see patients, they curse all the time and they don't seem to do it less. Uh, unless you can sort of think of like, you know, maybe they would, uh, I don't know if it's something like a release from interference, this idea that you would experience like a short period where fuck doesn't have its power after you say it like a lot of times. Um, and then you take a break, two minute break, and then it's back to itself, back to the original. Because again, you know, you see patients that curse all the time and they hear themselves cursing all the time and yet they still can't inhibit it. So my thought would be no to that. But again, I don't think it's been really tested. I think there's also a, a, a real danger uh, perhaps uh, of, of trying this out, right? You wouldn't want to, as a clinician, you wouldn't want to be responsible for uh, starting a perseveration or making it worse. Yeah, yeah. When we talk about, you know, when we think about measurement, uh, this is what this is kind of like a, a funny aspect of this when we think about like neuropsychology and, and verbal fluency, right? So when we think about letter fluency, um, what are the most commonly normed letters that are, are, are for, you know, letter fluency tests? Tell me as many words as you can start with the letter F, right? So our neuropsych norms, what are they based on? What letters are they based on? Do people know? The most common three are F, A, and S. Right, and so you think you got a brain injured patient, you say, tell me as many words that you can start with the letter F. You're inviting them to drop the F bomb and to ruin session. And then A and S are also, it's basically like the trifecta of cursing in English, like fuck, asshole, and shit. Like, why didn't they pick, <laughs> they could have picked better letters for that. So yeah, so there's times like where you, clearly what you could do in the tasks that actually could make people curse more. Uh, and again, this relates to like, I think there's, different reasons for cursing and different neurological disorders where cursing happens. Some would benefit from things like improved emotion regulation, improved uh, self-monitoring of basically learning when you're going into the red and being able to basically pressure valve yourself. Um, and others are, you know, like in global aphasia, I don't know the answer to it. You know, this idea of like, how do you inhibit a reflex? Um, I don't know. Um, some of the research in Tourette's has been interesting using things like cognitive behavioral therapy will, where people will build up and say like they want to curse at someone. Um, like they'll, they'll, you know, they'll almost say like, they'll, they'll describe like, I have the urge to call this person like a cunt, right? But then they get to modify it and they get, they, it says like you're Kurt or you're Kurt, right? So they, they, they change the word phonologically at the last second. So that basically this idea of like, uh, they can change a bit. Phasia, I don't think they can.
what the heck? Right? What the heck? Yeah. Isn't that the same thing? Yeah, the same. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, yeah exactly. I think that <laughs> what the heck brings us to the end of the of the question session, Jamie. Thank you so oh, much. Yeah, thank you all for thank you all for listening to me. And thanks for the invitation, Dirk.